Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I go by the name of Alan Cohen, and uh, today I'm connecting with a beautiful spirit that goes by the name of David Hoffmeister. Uh, it is my custom to start interviews and programs with a short prayer. So, David, would it be okay if we pray in for a moment? Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So, let's just take a moment to recognize that we've all been guided here for a reason, that spirit is in charge. There are gifts for everyone here. And so we open now to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We see both David and myself sharing what is most helpful to everyone listening, watching live or to the archive. And we ask that only healing and well-being come from our gathering by the grace of God. So it is. Mm, beautiful. Amen. It's lovely. So, David, you have a wonderful new book out, This Moment is Your Miracle. And I'm imagining that it's representing the cutting edge of your growth and your path on course. So let's hear a little bit about what, what's in this book that's new and exciting for you and the readers and what, what gifts you'd like to share through this book. Well, when I think about this book, I think about wanting it to be really concise and profound and practical all in one, uh, so that someone can, can really pick it up and use it uh, in a very practical way. So it's meant to be inspirational, but also to draw people into uh, the practice of practicing the presence and, and really being in the moment and living in the moment, because I'm a big, uh, big fan of practical application. I always say it's 1% principle and 99% practice. And so not to discount the principle, because that's very important too, to be very clear of the non-dual and the, and the oneness, but also to really put that into practice in everyday life. And so that was my desire behind extending this book right now at, during these times. And, and I love the title, Maintaining a Spiritual Awareness, even during times when world events are cuckoo. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about because we live in pretty crazy times. I mean, even as we're recording this, we're in the midst of the longest government shutdown in, in the country's history. And there's terrorism and nationalism and prejudice and just crazy, crazy stuff. So. What would you say to somebody who says, you know, it's a really nuts world. How can I survive here? And how can I live a conscious life when most of the people around me are going crazy in one form or another? Yeah, I think, I think we have to reframe it and, and we have to put it in some kind of context because without a context, it seems like madness, absolutely madness. Every day you wake up and it's like, what now? <laughs> what, what can possibly be going on next? But... Um, but once we bring it back to this thing that, that really all we're doing is allowing the unconscious, the darkness, uh, to arise in awareness, then that's really the context we want to, to have and keep it in. Because it's like when we're watching our own emotions and we're watching our own reactions, then it's comforting to know that, that those reactions are always coming from interpretations and that we do have that power of interpretation and no one can take that away from us we we can interpret as we choose and uh, ultimately I think that's very empowering that's why we need this context because without this context it can seem like a very depressing uh, disempowering experience on planet earth at this time so would you say that the politicians seem pretty nuts are actually drawing forth stuff from our collective subconscious so we can shine the light on and heal it? Is that one of the purposes of a, an apparently crazy administration? Would you say something like that? Yeah, I would say that, that there's underlying everything, there's an agreement in the sense that um, it's like a, a prearranged plan, a prearranged script that things are brought up uh, at certain times and, and it's really not a random. Uh, the depressing thought would be to think, oh my gosh, uh, that we've gone off the track somewhere and 
um, or to try to take it in a personal way of saying, what is this politician reflecting uh, in my mind, and uh, can I possibly be that messed up? You know, that's what people <laughs> say to me sometimes. <laughs> so you're talking about healing the inner Trump now, is that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I mean, you know, that seems to be the one of the key things that's up in awareness now, really for everybody on the planet. And because uh, I, I travel a lot, so I'm uh, pretty much aware of that. But it's not like when I, a, a couple years ago, uh, when I was down going around through Mexico, uh, they were, they were voicing their questions. They were just upset with politics in general. They were quite upset with, with their own president and with the president of the United States. So, so it was more of a, of a frustration around uh, political ineffectiveness. And I do, I do feel like that's a, a big theme. And, and I do feel it is, it has a blessing where we start to realize the power of our thoughts and that in A Course in Miracles, we're told uh, it is with your thoughts that we must work. So I think it starts to put the focus more on what is the content of my thinking instead of looking outside and, and being tempted and lured into the, the blaming and the complaining, and which, which really is disempowering. So it would seem as if the game is to change the external political environment and rearrange chess pieces and get your party in. When meanwhile, it's an inner process where you're working with internal process, uh, politics more than external ones. Yeah, that's ex exactly it. I think it's when that's the focus, um, you know, we are told in A Course in Miracles, what you do comes from what you think. And so again, if we start to think of behaviors as more as just byproducts or results or effects of thinking, then that's a big step because then we can really start to focus in, zero in on, on the thinking. What is the content of my thoughts? And I think all sages throughout history have really tried to do that. They've just tried to say, the truth is within you. Pay attention to how you're feeling. Don't disregard your feelings. Don't repress them and, and try to just gloss over them, but uh, use them as, as barometers, as touchstones for what's going on in your consciousness. And, and so in that sense, we are really kind of having to get more focused in that way what, to what all the sages and the saints have been saying for many centuries. Yeah. Well, which brings me to a really interesting question I'm often asked, and it's very fascinating me to find an answer. People say, well, is the world really evolving spiritually or is it getting worse? And I used to give them an answer about what I saw was going on in the outer world. But lately, I've been saying, you know, the world is what it is. And if there's anything evolving, it's our own particular consciousness. So do you ever see the world evolving to a place that's going to be, quote, heaven on earth? Or basically, is the world just what it is? And we get to deal with it and join it or go to Holy Spirit's world? What would you say about that? Well, I see the world as symbols, so um, I've been curious, like you have, about many of the different world religions and spiritualities, and I can remember quite a few years ago, actually decades ago, when, um, when I picked up this big thick book that was thicker than the Course, it was called the Urantia Book. And, uh, and I was kind of fascinated because it really presented more of an evolutionary cosmology on a much broader scale. Urantia being Earth, and then the tiny little crude planet <laughs> that's not very far developed, kind of like Neil Donald Walsh when uh, he asked God uh, in his conversations, if this was a football field and we were talking about Earth and evolution, uh, what, what yard line would be, we be on? How far do we have to go for a touchdown? I like these kind of questions. And, and God said, well, you're on the five yard line. You're on your own five. You got 95 uh, yards to march. And then when you think of the Urantia book, it was, Earth was pretty much described as a very crude, backward planet. I think, um, I think Ramtha, uh, through Jay-Z Knight, said a similar thing uh, on What the Bleep, you know, that, that it's, it's pretty primitive uh, in terms of evolutionary development. So 
I think that if you take it from that concept of looking at it in terms of symbols, it is possible that there will be uh, symbols that will get brighter and brighter and brighter and seem more evolved, although we also have to keep in the back of our mind that there's no order of difficulty in miracles and that there's really no hierarchy in illusions. That's what the blessing of the Course is. It really just hammers that home, no hierarchy of illusions. And so I, I think the people have to relate to it. So I do feel when people say, I want to see more of a heaven on earth, I would rather see things really evolving. And I, I do feel like that's a question of desire. If you really, if you really want that and you, your mind is so powerful, then you will see symbols lighting up all over. And uh, you've been writing these amazing books, which I find uh, just delightful and fascinating. And I find on my travels for the last 30 some years that I do see lots of symbols. There's lots of laughter, there's lots of hugs. And it's at the level that I'm sharing and extending, I'm getting kind of flooded with miracles. I, you know, like they talk about Ama hugging people. I, I've been hugged by many people for, for decades now. And so I, that maybe is why I have such a smile on my face. I'm actually experiencing the effects of my <laughs> giving and extending. So this kind of comes to the happy dream, doesn't it? So, you know, is it possible to live in a happy dream where as individuals or collectively a subset of society that we're living heaven on earth, even while other people are living in hell on earth? Or do we have to wait till everybody gets out of hell in order for us to live in heaven? It's a big metaphysical question, but let's, yeah. uh, let's hear it. Well, I, I feel that the, the teachings of quantum physics, the teachings of the saints and mystics are all teaching us that there is no world apart from our consciousness, that we're literally experiencing a motion picture of our consciousness. And so I've gone into that and it just feels more and more and more, it just feels like, wow, this is really true. This, this is no just a, kind of a, a kind thing to say. This is an actual experience. So I would say that, that when we talk about the collective or we talk about individual enlightenment, I actually feel it's, it's only at the level of, of the mind. And, and purified consciousness is, uh, shows us the results of that. And so to me it's very practical. I'm always going around saying, talking with people and listening and, and saying how practical this is. And, and it's not like a, a burying your head in the sand like an ostrich and pretending there's no external world. It's actually diving in and saying, show me spirit, you have to convince me that there's no external world and that this is, is my own hallucination and, and this will be my happy dream of non-judgment when I'm not judging anyone or anything anymore, then I'll, I'll feel the happiness. Yeah. One of the things that so impresses me about you, David, is you are indeed practical. And, you know, of the many Course teachers out there, I really look to you as somebody who truly models bringing the Course to Earth and living it. Lots of people kind of go off on intellectual metaphysical tangents, but you bring it down to Earth. You, you can do a workshop next to a slaughterhouse. <laughs> I remember that story. <laughs> it was a hard one for me because I, I would have been disturbed by it, I think. But, but you actually, tell that story, would you? Because I think, I think it's a very inspiring story. Would you, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I was in Aarhus, uh, Denmark, and, and I always leave it up to the organizers as far as choosing the venues and everything. So uh, when I was first going there, I, I was like, well, this is like the factory district or whatever. Uh, this isn't your typical, uh, like on Maui, where you've got the beautiful setting. This was far from it uh, when I went in there. And then uh, as I would go for a lunch break or take a walk, uh, it did dawn on me uh, when I looked across, I thought, this is a, there's a slaughterhouse right across the street from where I'm doing the gathering. And yet I have such joy and compassion where uh, I, I really take it to heart when, when I'm told from spirit, join with whatever, join with all your perceptions. You know, if, uh, join with the sky, join with the animals, join with everyone around you, you know, have that sense of, of joining and connecting with everything. And so when I was walking along back from lunch, I believe, uh, uh, 
I just decided to go right over there to the edge of the slaughterhouse and look right into the rows where the animals um, were going through to, to be slaughtered. And really just do eye gazing. I mean, I took it as an opportunity. I mean, we do this in some of our retreats, but I said, no, this is my opportunity to gaze into their eyes. Because I felt like there was a communication going on there, where there was a, they were expressing a, through their eyes mainly a fear. Like, what is happening? There was disorientation, there was fear, uh, and, and I, I see that as, as, as really a call for love. So I actually took the time to be very, very present and to look right into their eyes and assure them everything's going to be okay. The same thing a child wants from a parent. Uh, just that loving gaze of looking into your eyes and with the feeling, the full feeling, everything's going to be okay. It's, it's all going to work out. You'll see, you'll see it, is what I was telepathically extending. So, you know, that was important because once we got back into the workshop, people were having reactions uh, to the location, to the venue, and there was a lot of emotions coming up, and we, we really had to use that fully for clearing in, in there. Yeah, that's quite a teaching. It's like looking head on, head on at death and denying it as an illusion, which is probably the biggest challenge that most people have, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's so much of, a, of an identification with the body, with matter, uh, with appearances as being reality. And I remember in the Course, Jesus even says, what you believe, you make true for you. Meaning, subjectively, what you give over your mind to with, with the sense of belief. Uh, you make up uh, an, a world in which it will seem to have reality for you until you withdraw your mind from, from that belief. And so it's, it's quite a, an optical delusion of consciousness, I think is what Einstein called it. And uh, he was quite a, a deep, profound thinker as well, and he came to the same awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of animals, lots of spiritual teachers say that animals don't have the same fear of death as people because in general they're living closer to spirit. So is that your experience or do you believe that? Yeah, I do think they oftentimes reflect that. I know like with pets sometimes um, they'll even do things that more are a reflection of almost like they want to show compassion uh, for their owners, and they're kind of tuned in to their owners' uh, emotions. And I feel there's a great wisdom in that. So I feel like they, they reflect a presence there that's, that's very strong and uh, very, very loving and compassionate. Yeah, I, I've learned a lot from my dogs. They're my teachers of God in many ways. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk a little bit about, about your own path, David. Uh, so. I'd be interested in hearing what is the cutting or leading edge of your own consciousness, your own study of the Course. What is, what is passion exciting and, and titillating? Maybe that's, that's the best word. What's invigorating to you in terms of your study of the Course lately or your spiritual practice? Yeah, it's, I feel like it, I go through phases kind of where there's like a, a bit of a, of a stepping back and, a, and quiet phases. I've had phases over the years where I've kind of gone off to hermitages and it's been very inward, almost more of traditional uh, mysticism uh, than, than being out. And, and I enjoy that aspect and I really enjoy what seems to be the public uh, phase. Like Jesus was kind of a public mystic uh, teaching out in the, in the square and from the boat and everything like that. So. For me, I think uh, it is kind of, I feel like I'm coming more in, inward to one of those uh, inward phases where I don't speak as much, I haven't been doing as many uh, public gatherings and travels. Uh, just, uh, I was talking uh, to Miranda McPherson uh, recently and she was saying, yeah, she started to do more digital things and just feel the blessing like we're doing right now. Uh, the, it's just this beautiful radiant transmission and it's uh, so easy. Whereas I contrast that with my many years of 
you know, going all over the place, even India, China, Japan, some really crowded places where, you know, you're almost like navigating <laughs> the body through seas of people. And uh, I loved all that. I absolutely adored it. But it does feel more of a phase of, of, of using the digital transmissions and also going into more of a, a quiet inward phase. So, uh, the Dalai Lama said that, uh, you may not believe this, but he said it, that he wishes he could quit being the Dalai Lama and just go home and do his spiritual practice. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm misquoting somehow, but that was the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, I know recently I met with uh, Muji over in Portugal at his place, Sahaja, and uh, you know his body was like 64 and mine was about 60. You know, it's like he was also just what the Dalai Lama was saying. He was like looking ready to get a put a backpack on and just go disappear with all the people pressing on him. And so we both just kind of smiled and looked in each other's eyes, like, "Yeah, brother, <laughs> I totally, I totally feel where, right where you're at." Because it was real similar for both of us. <laughs> well, you know, you and I are both movie buffs. I'm sure you're a big fan of the Life of Brian. Do you remember that movie? Yeah. Yes, very well. Where you know they're trying to make Brian into into the great Messiah, and he's just a bozo, you know. And they're all following. Get out of here! Leave you alone! I said, "Well, Master, how shall we leave you alone?" <laughs> like, right. There was great from people wanting to pull on him and tell him what how to live. So, you know, I can appreciate that as well. Yeah, yeah, we like the humor. You know, what will we do without the humor of those scenes? You know, that they, it just makes it all the easier for us to continue on when we can laugh like that. Well, what does the Course say that the separation occurred when the Son of God forgets to laugh? Yes, yeah? something like that. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So, um, we have people who are listening to us who are new to the Course and people who have been with it for a while. Everybody who does the Course experiences some resistance to it. So, what do you say to people who've been into it a little while and say, I don't know, I got to lesson 50 and I got bummed out and I quit. So, you know, what advice would you give to people who, who value the value of the Course, but kind of get pulled to the side as we all do one way or the other? How do you, how do you encourage them to continue? Well, I think to me the context is so important because uh, m most of us, get into the spiritual journey in a way where we we're hoping that our meditation practice or our spiritual practices will improve our life, our life experiences as a human being. And I think a lot of people have that experience that they, they tell me, my life was not too bad. Uh, and then I got in the course and it just got so much worse. Uh, the, the intensity the floods of those extreme emotions started to come in, almost like they consciously were taking the lid off of various defense mechanisms or protections that they weren't even aware of it. And I think one of the biggest reasons for the resistance and the struggles with the Course is it's still there's this underlying assumption that somehow I, I need to bring love and light and God into my personal relationships and my personal perspective of who I am, when in fact it's kind of a washing away and a rinsing of the entire persona. Uh, it's, it's almost going like pulling into a power wash and, uh, and having the hoses turned on, and, it, and it's very disillusioning to the ego, because the ego is like, oh, come on, you got to be kidding. Like, you cannot be serious. So what I tell people is, is if we can just take like one statement from the Course as being uh, very valid, that the world is backwards and upside down, then it's, we're going to have an experience for most of us, it's, it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland, you know, through the looking glass, like tumbling down the rabbit hole. So instead of the Course being like a band-aid to help patch your personal life together, uh, like the Scarecrow on The Wizard of Oz, it's more like all the straw is, is meant to come out. It's meant to get thrown all over the road. And then there's something deeper still that I know you refer to in your books and just your more recent book about the, the Tao, the Made Easy. You know, there's that deep, deep bedrock of, of spirit and truth 
that's there when, when things start to really dismantle and fall apart. And so that's what I would tell people is there, there is a disillusionment that goes on with the dismantling and don't be too frightened or shocked by that, but actually be open to when that's occurring, there's, you're actually progressing, you're actually advancing and you're, you're clearing the mind and clearing the consciousness and don't, don't throw the towel in or don't be too quick to conclude, oh my God, I've, I'm really messed up and other people are sane and I'm insane, because that's, that's not really the truth of it. Yeah. One of my favorite lines from the Course is, you cannot be your own guide to miracles because it was you who's made them necessary. Yeah. So, you know, if your life was working, you wouldn't need a miracle. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I was in college, I was assigned to read a book by a Polish psychologist named, I think, Dombrowski, and it was called Positive Disintegration. And he was a psychiatrist in a mental institution. He found that some people's lives became so dysfunctional that they actually had to fall apart before they could rebuild them. So it sounds to me like you're alluding to the same kind of falling apart that's actually a prerequisite to reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah, I really believe that. I mean, I, I see that in my own path and then also when I travel around the world and I meet people who, let's say, have gone through the 12-step program and they will describe this, this dark period, this dark night of the soul, this disillusionment that's really been a big part of them turning things around. You know, like even opening to a higher power, they say they had to almost like a hit, hit bottom or hit a rock bottom. And I hear it so much, and I went through it myself, so I, I think that's important for us to talk about that and openly be transparent about that because that's a part of the healing that goes on in 12-step groups. There's so much witnessing, there's so much transparency. Everyone who gives their lead really says, here's how it was, here's what I did, and here's how it is now, you know, and, and that's important. I think one of the steps is our lives became unmanageable. Yes. And I think we have to admit, maybe not our whole life, but aspects of our life that are unmanageable, they're the ones that are calling for healing. That's what the call for love is. Yes, it's true. It really is true. Was there a time, David, when your life or part of it was unmanageable and, and the Course rescued you? Or what was your evolution in terms of the aha that the Course was really one of your best friends in this journey? Well, I think, you know, what I found really to be helpful is, is in relationships because there's a lot of spiritualities that don't really incorporate relationships into the equation of, of healing. They're very fine pathways to God, they're very devotional. But I found for myself those chapters uh, between 15 and 24 about special hate relationships and then special love relationship, that was like a saving grace for me. Because I think, I loved reading that passage where the Spirit was, Jesus was saying, you've almost heaven, you've almost made it back to heaven, you just have one block remaining, and it's the special relationship. Because I think, you know, there can be a dis disillusionment and a dismantling around sickness and health issues, around financial issues, uh, around uh, concerns around politics and everything. But, but the ones that kind of really seem to rip our heart open are the relationships. Like that scene in Braveheart, you know, Mel Gibson, where the, the seeming betra betrayal scene, just a look on his face of absolute unbelievability, like he cannot believe that his, his buddy would turn on him. And to me, I think that's some of the most extreme pain that we face. So I think the Course, if, you had, if I had to pick one thing, I would say that was the saving grace of lift me up into serve a purpose for the whole, instead of trying to focus in on, on one person or uh, looking for salvation uh, somehow in, in a person. Yeah. Well, I've been there too. I think we shared that same path. Well, I was a little longer than 15 to 24, more like 15 to 50, but 
you can it's still somewhat yeah, you get it when you get it. <laughs> but let's talk about let's talk about special relationships because it is you know it is a big hot issue for lots of folks. So let's see if we can dissect it according to the course. Why do people focus in on one person and say, you are the one and you are the soulmate and you are my twin flame. And usually, in my experience, and probably yours as well, that leads to disaster. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, can you talk a bit about the dynamic of, of, of zeroing on somebody as your savior? It could be a guru as well as a romantic yeah. relationship. And then, you know, what you set yourself up for when you do that. I'd like to hear from you, please. Yeah. Well, one of the lines that always helped me was from the Beyond All Idols section of the Course, where Jesus says, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. So when I first read that, I said, wow, that's almost like an eclipse. Like when I decide upon the form of what I want, my, my to focus goes on the form and, and then the purpose for the relationship is eclipsed by the form. He says, you, you, your will is universal and cannot be content with any form of any kind. So he's saying we're, we are entitled to vastness. We, we will only know happiness in vastness. We can't shrink down our vastness. God's will can't be shrunk down into an idol. And so that gave me a broader appreciation of idols because uh, he, he starts off in there in that section, what is an idol do you think you know? When Jesus puts do you think you know in there after his statement, you know, it's almost like he's saying, do you really think you know? Are you following me? Thank so I, I have really gone into that and I've started to realize that if forgiveness is just seeing the false as false, forgiveness is not buying the trick of, of form, uh, thinking that God's will can be shrunk down to a specific form, then it makes perfect sense that when I am riveted on an outcome, on a particular person, place, thing, whenever I try to make every, anything sacred even in this world, you know, sacred, the holy water, or the holy vortex, or the, the holy ashram, or whatever, it's, it's always a version of me saying no to forgiveness. Let me just have my special little thing here, my little amulet, or whatever it is, my little altar, and give it to me. Can you just let me have a little happiness with this little thing? And the Spirit's like, You'll, you'll never be happy with that little thing. You'll only be happy with vastness. And I think all of us know somewhere inside that that's true, you know, that, that we will only be content with vastness. I, I studied with a mystic teacher named Hilda Charlton in New York, and she was in India for many years. She told the story that once she climbed to the top of the Himalayas to this very remote ashram, and as she was nearing the ashram, she heard a voice say, that's my pillow. <laughs> In other words, no, it's my pillow. No, it's my pillow. And these two yogis were arguing over whose meditation pillow it was. And here they had renounced the entire world at the top of the Himalayas, and they were fighting over this little pillow. <laughs> so you, you know, you take your neurosis with you wherever you go. You can't escape it by going to a mountaintop. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. Well, let's get back to people in special relationships. So... Let's say somebody finds himself in a special relationship with a person, a romantic, sexual, or a marriage, or whatever, and they feel stuck. There's enmity, there's judgment. Um, what, what can somebody do to turn a special relationship that is steeped in fear, or guilt, or enmity to a holy relationship? What is, what is the shifting point in that situation? Well, to me, I think the shift would be is focus on what is what are the gifts like all of us have so many gifts to give we have so many gifts to extend to everyone to the whole universe to the whole sonship and if we can start to focus on the gifts how can i nurture that how can i extend that how can i clear my mind of expectations so that i may truly appreciate the one who i am and the one who's right in front of me 
then that will radiate a blessing to the whole universe. So it's so different than this getting mechanism. I think that's really the problem in, in interpersonal relationships is just is still valuing this idea, meet my needs, uh, get the things that I want. Uh, I was just reading right before I came over here for this interview, uh, the, this tennis player, uh, Rafael Nadal, uh, just after he lost in the Australian Open, he just got engaged. Uh, to uh, his girlfriend of 14 years. And uh, he, they were asking him, is she here? And yeah, she's here. She came over as a wild card. But, but basically he was saying, you know, she just comes to, to be with me if she really wants to. Uh, and if she doesn't want to come, she doesn't come. Uh, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way to go into an engagement, uh, is having that allowance, like, Really be intuitive and, and just offer what you want to offer, but there's not this expectation that I'm, oh, I'm playing in a tennis tournament and you better be there, or you better meet my needs because I'm concentrating on my op opponent or whatever. You know, there's, there's so much need meeting, meeting needs in relationships that is, it's really based on this sense of lack and getting. So that's what we're trying to purify from. We're, we want to celebrate relationships, but I don't think we can fully celebrate as long as we're trying to get something from somebody else. And, and that's what the healing is, letting that go. It's all about bringing out the best in each other instead of keeping each other in the box. Yeah. Um, may I ask you, David, about your evolution in relationships? I know you've come a long way since age 24. <laughs> and, you know, how do you view um, romantic or partnerships these days? Is this something that's on, in your radar or in your community? Is that a big issue? What is, what is the cutting edge of your understanding of partnership and those, those around you? Yeah, I feel like the spirit can uses everything. And so uh, it, I think that can be very supportive. I think more from my perspective right now is that I see the witnesses all around me uh, as, as the reflections of, of purpose. So my focus is really on, on the purpose, on the shared purpose, lighting up with that, uh, being excited by that, being exhilarated, feeling the joy and the passion of that shared purpose. So I think probably I would say like for myself and for the community, it's, there's a focus on, on shared purpose and there's lots of collaborations that involve uh, numbers of people, little configurations of teams and projects that can extend in, in a broader way to, to the whole world. And there's a synergy, uh, a very strong synergy that comes from that, that really lights us up. There, there is an exhilaration with that, that synergy. So I would say we don't like go to either end of the scale. We don't have like Vows like the Franciscans, you know, poverty, chastity, obedience, and, and, you know, traditional convents and monasteries. And neither do we uh, put something like romance together as, as, as an ideal for everyone in the community. Because in our community, there's maybe like 45 people. Uh, some are paired up in, in very ways, that, given ways that feel very natural and helpful and nurturing. And uh, then there are those that are, that are really just into God and, and more internal and not really uh, interested in uh, interpersonal relationships in the same way that they were at an earlier time in their life. So it's kind of a, just a, a sense of acceptance and trust of let the Spirit use everything for the highest good. Do you think this purpose and future in the nuclear family, or do you think that, think that model is changing? Well, I actually, I mean, I always see the value in that, so I'm always happy to see when that's a nurturing thing. But for many people, I think a lot of young people today, they feel very alienated. Uh, like the millennial generation, they almost feel like, how did I even get born into this culture and, and this family? Like they feel completely disconnected. And so I actually, feel very much like Yogananda used to talk about, about how groups come together vibrationally, drawn together by the Spirit to nurture and support, sometimes course groups, or uh, I know there's a lot of Ananda communities, 
around the world, I do feel there's a nurturing happening when people have a, a very strong shared purpose, spiritual purpose, and then they give themselves over to that, and then the configuration is designed to help elevate the awareness, not so much to perpetuate a bloodline or pass on the family business or maintain a culture that's been around for decades or generations, you know, it's, it's more of a vibrational sense of us coming together in that way. Because there's a lot of historical reasons for marriage, you know, like you said, political, social, cultural, religious, and a lot of those, I think, we've outgrown. I mean, people do not marry, well, let's put it this way, ideally, people do not marry for political purposes. There's, there's another reason to get together besides you're going to you know, keep up with the Joneses. Dee and I saw a very interesting movie a couple months ago. Um, it was called One Husband, Three Wives. And it was a documentary about a, a Mormon polygamous community. And we watched it because we thought it'd be funny and interesting. But actually, these people really had a lot of love and a lot of support for each other. And it expanded my mind to see that where there's love, anything can work. Whether it's whether you're a monk or a, a nuclear family of two people or an extended nuclear family, so I was impressed by the fact that their principles on which their lives were based were bigger than the form that their family configuration was taking. Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree. I I mean I re remember in my own journey way back before I even found the course. I read this book by Thea Alexander called 2150 AD. And uh, I remember opening it and going, oh, this is mind expanding. You know, I, I was fascinated uh, by it. But I think it was, it was good for me because um, it allowed me to travel around, live in some spiritual communities, meet lots of people, be exposed to lots of ideas and start to stretch out of the boxes that I had, Protestant, you know, more tra traditional boxes. And then I enjoyed that. And then I also have this sense of integrity, like um, I feel like all of us, if we're going to be guided by the Spirit to use certain symbols, we can't just dismiss the symbols that we're given to use. So for people who are using the symbol of marriage, for example, I think they're taking that on through intuitive guidance and they feel it, it's very important, but they have to honor that symbol. And because it's part of their own mind training, it's part of their own clearing away whatever distractions and temptations are and, and coming to a sense of integrity, which is really in the mind. It's not so much a personal thing, it's, it's integrity in the mind. And then when people take on other symbols, I'm, I rejoice with them too, because I, I, sometimes they're more into diet or yoga or exercise than they are into interpersonal relationships. So I'll just join them right there and say, tell me, how's your discipline going? I'd love to hear more about it. So what I hear you saying is that it's more important to be integrity with the choice of symbols than to bicker over whether this symbol is it, is it or not. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. It's a, I feel like there is no universal culture. There are no universal symbols. I mean, you know, there's there's general agreement, you know, thou shalt not kill, and then you, you meet pygmies or, you know, people that, that say, no, we don't agree <laughs> with that. So there is no universal theology. There is no universal culture. We can't just say these are good symbols and these are bad symbols. It's it's more the integral use of the symbols and the purpose behind the symbols that I always say is where it's, we have to really come to a, an allegiance, a, a loyalty there. Well stated, thank you. So a while back you mentioned millennials. So let's talk about the evolution of technology and you know the world that kids age 10, 20, 30 are growing up in are, is quite different than the world that you and I grew up in. And so, Talk a little bit, if you would, about technology. It certainly is a light side to it, but then there's a dark side to it. So how can we reach people who have a hard time communicating without their thumbs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Well, you know, I, I do like that movie, Her, 
And uh, I remember there's a scene where all these people are moving up and down these steps and they all have their, they're just focused on their little smartphones and the little thumbs are going. Amazingly, they're not running into each other. They're, they must be somewhat intuitive. But, but I actually feel like, again, the question is always, what is it for? So just like with anything, if, if we're not really clear with the purpose out front, then anything can be hijacked by the ego. And certainly technology uh, is a good example of that, where people, if they really let the ego hijack the technology, it can get into isolationism, it can, can get into all kinds of manners of defense and avoidance uh, that is, instead of hiding around a, a, a persona mask, it's almost hiding behind, uh, you know, get, having a, an avatar or something where people don't even put, put their picture online anymore out of fear of something. And, and talk about hiding behind an image, you know, literally having an avatar that, that speaks for them. And so I, I think it's, it's really the purpose underneath that's the most important. One of my clients said she was addicted to social media. And I, I asked her, what is the value in it? Like, why, why is that more fun for you than dealing with people directly? She said, because I'm afraid of people. And she said, a person, a face-to-face -face human interaction is threatening to me. So it's easier for me to have a buffer by a, by a device that keeps me one, one level away from the people I'm afraid of. I can, I can control that and manage that more than just dealing with that upfront, close, up, up close and personal relationship. Yeah, I, I really find that I enjoy watching uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix or some of these series and some of these things they're coming out with now around clones or all different kinds of devices that um, are really just using technology you know, back in our days, we would we'd tune into Star Trek, you know, whatever version or year. But, but there's a lot of really good shows that are coming out that I'm actually enjoying using to do commentary on that use a lot of super high technology. And yet it really starts to get to the core of, of getting into the guidance, into the intuition and away from the reacting and responding to, to the images. So it's really how we use it that determines its value. What's this for? Yeah, yeah. Here you and I, I'm in Hawaii, <laughs> here in Mexico, and we're reaching people all around the globe at this very moment through technology. So, you know, spirit can use any technology that the ego can use, and the spirit can use it in spirit's purpose. That's, that's how I like to hold it. Yeah, I mean, I've been amazed... I've, I've kind of been doing this for a couple decades now using movies and music, but particularly the movies and the episodes I'm coming up with, the Spirit is showing me that, you know, people would always ask me, how, how can I go the most rapid way into a spiritual, profound experience? And it's more and more, I can sit with a group of people, I'm guided to use a specific episode or a specific movie, and the combination of the movie, the pauses, the commentary just uncorks something where uh, people go into a mystical experience. And so, the, again, it's the, the music and the movies being used in a very precisely guided way seems to be somehow a time saver or something that pops the cork. You know, and a good director and good acting can bring to light a huge spiritual lesson that you would not read, not, not get by reading a self-help book. I mean, Jesus taught in parables. He was, he was a master of the story. And you tell lots of stories, and so do I. And it gets to people on a subconscious level that the intellect doesn't quite, quite touch. Yeah. So speaking of Jesus, we both love Jesus. So... Uh, would you talk about your relationship with Jesus as a teacher, as a mentor, as a guide? How, how has that evolved and you know, how does it transcend what you were taught when you grew up? A lot of people still struggle with Jesus and Christianity because they have negative history with it. But, but of course, there's much more to it than that. So let's hear about your relationship with Jesus, if I may. Yeah, it's, it's one of, of such uh, devotion, respect, um, and yet there's that sense of equality that's, that's there, that's so pervasive. Uh, 
even this past year, I met somebody who was, had been raised Mormon, and they, they spent a little bit of time with me, and they just were like shaking their head. They said, I've never met anybody that loved Jesus like you love Jesus, or talks about Jesus the way you talk about Jesus in such natural terms, like, like he's right there with you all the time. And I feel like that's, it's kind of gone from more of an adoration uh, and, a, and a devotion more into a sense of a merge where now it's, it's like that, uh, that uh, Paul McCartney and Wing song, don't ever ask me why I never say goodbye to my love, it's understood. What to me is understood is the presence is so here and now, so in the moment that when I want people to, if they, if they read this book, This Moment is Your Miracle, I want them to go into an experience of the moment. Oh, I've got to go higher with it. Well, it has to be an experience where they're just so like, oh my gosh, like a discovery of that presence. And then I did another book a while back, um, Quantum Forgiveness, Physics, Meet Jesus. People love that title, Physics, Meet Jesus. <laughs> and again, there's, you can kind of see that face on there, very softly. So it's pretty uh, much for me, it's been like a merge, I have to say, where uh, at the beginning I was raised Christian, and so when I was into the course at the beginning, I had the same experience a lot of people do, which there's a little bit of embarrassment or something in there with talking about Jesus or even being concerned, how will this be received? And now it just feels like it's been such a merge that, that uh, the Spirit just speaks through me in any context or any situation where the, there's love there. And the, I don't get to choose the words, even, uh, even the word Jesus. There's sometimes a smile or a hug or a pat on the back is, is the most that can be extended. And, uh, and I just love that. He is my Sadhguru as well. And I have a, I think of all the great spiritual teachers, my relationship with him has been the most empowering. He's, he's real to me. And, you know, it's not the religious Jesus or the historical Jesus. To me, it's, a, it's the personal Jesus. It's, it's the one who told Helen Shuckman that he would help her buy a winter coat if, <laughs> if she needed it. Do you remember that story? Yeah. Yeah, well, forgot. <laughs> let's talk about how Jesus or higher power is willing to actually touch us in the midst of our material life. Sometimes we think we go into spirituality, we have to be a monk, and we know it's food and clothing and money. But do you think that God, higher power, Holy Spirit is willing to really reach into the nitty gritty of our physical life and help us with things that we're worried and afraid about? that are quite material. Is that your experience or, or, or otherwise? Yeah, I, I find that um, the Spirit is very practical, and part of that practicality is the Spirit reaches us in great detail and with great specificity. Uh, it, and even in the workbook, the Course, Jesus says, you believe in specifics, so it is specifics that we will work with. He comes right out. Uh, I find a lot of spiritualities, you know, all is God, all is one, all is love, and, and so forth. You know, it, it, if we're going to really have an experience in a full way, we have to realize that, that there has to be an unwinding that occurs, and that unwinding involves specifics. That's why I've always loved guidance. And, and for me, even when I would read a teacher say, well, you won't actually hear guidance in this lifetime, I would just be like, what? You know, because to me, it was, it was so practical. I mean, I couldn't even imagine unwinding the ego in a rapid way without guidance. And what I mean by guidance, I mean off very specific guidance. Call so-and-so, go here, go there. I feel like, to me, that was the greatest experience. After I really made contact, was I was not only willing to listen to that, instruction, that commentary, but also follow it. Uh, really, I saw the benefit of, of, of really following it. The ego at the beginning would object and say, are you crazy? You know, why, why would you 
ever do that? Or, you know, it was always trying to counter the guidance, but, but I quickly learned to really follow that guidance and that it was for my own good. Can you think of any examples of where you've been guided very specifically in a surprising way where something turned out really cool that you never would have known if it hadn't been specific guidance, anything in recent memory? Well, it's just there's been so many parts of my life, but I was just talking to a group recently, even before I had the course, I, I was guided to step out of graduate school. And I was in this real elite program with full scholarship, and there was only eight of us picked out of many hundreds. And uh, that was a good example for me of, uh, I'm a, I just tried to fight it. I tried to resist it. I, I, this can't be right. But actually, I see now, in retrospect, that I had a whole journey of extending and sharing uh, that I wouldn't have been able to dive into uh, and really be of full use if I had just hung on to that graduate program in school psychology and psychometrics and, and ways and, and intelligence tests. And it was way too tiny. For me, but at the time, it seemed like that was my whole life, my whole world. So that's an example that's kind of an extreme example. Did the guidance come and say, just leave that world? It was another world that it was introducing you to by contrast? Well, at that point, I was, it was guiding me out of one very kind of pressured elite graduate program into another one that was called Educational Foundations. That, that was very eclectic and very open. And, and I find that's how practical the spirit is. It's not always like giant steps of leave graduate school, but it actually guided me to my next step. And then the course came when I was in this Ed Foundations program. I was expanding my mind. And then Jesus said, OK, here, I've got a book for you now. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so it went beyond much faster. Who gave you the course? How did you get turned on to the course? Well, I was at a humanistic psychology conference out at uh, La Jolla, California. And uh -huh. uh, Virginia Satir was there, I think, and Francis Vaughn and uh, Roger Walsh, amazing uh, teachers, transpersonal psychologists. And so it was kind of in that, we both love psychology too, and you, you know, a humanistic psychology. Carl Rogers was there, that was the last conference he spoke at, and to be in the same auditorium with him. Uh, and then at the end, people rose. I didn't know that'd be the last time he would speak on planet Earth, but people rose and gave him like a 10-minute standing ovation. And my heart just blew open. I mean, I just had tears pouring down my face, and people were just applauding and cheering and cheering. And, and you know, when you look at... He, uh, Carl Rogers even uh, had a, uh, a young graduate assistant called William Thetford. Uh, some people don't know about. There's all these little connections where Jesus is using all these amazing teachers. Uh, and so I had, of course, I gained a huge appreciation for, for it that way. You know, it's really odd you should mention that because when I was in graduate school, I was in guidance and counseling, similar to what you were doing. and. Uh, my first class, a professor walks in and he puts a, a cassette player on the table. He says, here's my course. And he pressed the button and it was Sammy Davis Jr. singing, I gotta be me. And then he held up the book for the course, which was Carl Rogers on Encounter Groups. And I took that book home and I, could, I think I read it in one evening. I was, I was so hungry for authenticity and connection and trust and, and honoring of self. It, it was the spiritual food that I'd been craving and had no idea that I was craving. And that was the turning point in my life when I stepped off the intellectual path onto the spiritual path. So in an odd way, Carl Rogers was a turning point for both of us. Go I never knew that. <laughs> you find all these similarities, yeah. Because that was basically pretty radical. Uh, even most people knew of Freud, and most people knew of B.F. Skinner. And, and, but, but humanistic psychology was kind of like the, the new kid on the block. And yet both of us 
like lit up so much with that, that that was our journey into authenticity. And then later on when I heard Bill Thedford, you know, was a graduate assistant of Carl Rogers, I just had the biggest smile on my face, like, like, oh Jesus, you are having so much fun with all these characters. With synchronicities, which brings us to a, something else I wanted to talk to you about. So in those days, what we were doing was called the human potential movement. Yes. And I recently read a section of the course uh, called At Home in God, where Jesus says something, I'm paraphrasing, he says something like, he says, if you are still seeking to reach your potential, you are heading for something that already exists. He was saying, you know, what already is is eternal, and there's no use in reaching for something you already have. It's a big paraphrase, but that's the idea. Do you remember that at all? Do you want to comment on that concept, David? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was also in my work with the Course where I, I realized I was so much into self-help, I was so much into human potential, I was so much into expanding awareness, and then I think it was in one instant it started to dawn on me that, that Spirit was created perfect. Uh, it's like that idea that, that, that Spirit is in a state of grace forever, your reality is only spirit, therefore you are in a state of grace forever. To me, I, I read these little logical things, because I was big into philosophy, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Now that almost is giving us permission, I would say, to start to transcend the self-help, you know, the idea that sometimes Deepak will talk about pure potentiality, and, and yet reality isn't potentiality. You know, it, it, there's an actual state of spirit and, and a state of grace. And, and as soon as we acknowledge that, and we just go, I don't know what that is, but oh, does that sound really good. Uh, then already we're opening our, our prayer, our prayer of our heart to something that's even better, more transcending of than, than self-help and growth. Well, the self that's helping is a self that needs help. Not be on by to miracles because it's even made necessary. So, you know, are we talking now about the end of reaching, the end of striving, the end of trying to make something happen? Are we talking about I need do nothing? I think we're approaching that because, you know, it says right away at the beginning of the course that that it is not necessary to seek for what is true, but it is necessary to seek for what is false. So that's the step right before the grace, right before the I need do nothing. And, and I find there have been some really good teachers uh, in Advaita and the Course that really emphasize don't, don't use this uh, spiritual phraseology, don't use a bunch of uh, uh, affirmations to cover over this exposure. So I think the exposure is really important and we have to allow, that's what seeking for what is false is really about. That's the neti neti of the East, uh, expose, expose. And then there comes a point where you start to open up and say, okay, it, it is a realization that that comes to a place of stillness where the, the very thing that was seeking uh, and the very thing that was searching is not real. And there a, a, a calmness, a peace comes in. There's nothing driving anymore. There's nothing pushing. There's not even that in, inquiry that's so helpful, but it, it, there comes a point where the inquiry uh, dissolves away and we're just into beingness. I love that. You have a wonderful exercise in your new book where you talk about calling forth the fear so you can look at it head on. And, you know, we tend to gloss over fear and distract ourselves. But what I hear you saying is that if you really want to heal fear, you have to just let it, let it come up and boldly shine a light on it so you can heal it. So would you share that process? This is one of my favorite parts of your book. So let, let's hear about it from your own words, please. Well, the fear cannot be pushed out of awareness or denied because then you can't really go into the, the healing uh, while that fear is, is still down there. So 
uh, I've always really been open to all kinds of exercises, most of them call experiential exercises, where you're out of the comfort zone, where, where the fears just start coming up. Um, sometimes it could be as simple as, as an eye gazing exercise. You mentioned your friend that uses the social media to, to not have even those face-to-face -face encounters where the fear will start to rise up. And when it's coming up, uh, we don't have to try to fix it or offer advice. It's, that's why in expression sessions we, we really have those guidelines of no people pleasing, no private thoughts, because we want that emotion to come up. We want there to be a, a permission for that. We want to, there to be an openness to that, an acceptance. And so it's, it's encouraged. And I think another reason why people don't do it is because they fear the volatility of that emotion, the intensity of it, and also <coughs> underneath that, the, just the rejection, like, oh, if I, if I let this up, then I'll surely be rejected. So all those factors are, are around allowing that to come up. And when I went to China, for example, I go to these countries where there's a, a strong systematic uh, denial and repression mechanism, um, it's like they just come together with me in, in that presence of openness and acceptance and it just comes up like a geyser or a volcano. Uh, and, and, they, and they also feel how valuable this is, like they intuitively know this is going to be really important for me to heal, to let it up. So I did have, uh, my last time in China, I ended up doing a dance party and you should have seen those people dancing. <laughs> they were all over the place. They were so excited to have that opportunity. Wow. So you're, you're a great healer, man. You're really, you're really serving transformation on the planet. I, I want to remind people that we're celebrating your new book, which is coming out within a few days called This Moment is Your Miracle, with a wonderful subtitle, Spiritual Tools to Transcend Fear and Experience the Power of the Present Moment. So, goodness, David, anything else you'd like to share before we close? I just, I need to tell people that, you know, I fell in love with you when I discovered your YouTubes a while back, and I, I used to, you know, you're, you're, I've been doing the course for many years, and the clarity and simplicity and, humility and grace that you exude in your teachings really won me. So I, for, I still do sometimes, but for a long time, I, I listened to your YouTubes every night before I went to bed, and I just found them very soothing. It was a lovely way to uh, end the day and kind of go off into a nice space. It was much, much better than watching a horror movie. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I really want to honor you for the contribution you've made to me and so many other people. It's just, you're just a world-class teacher. Uh, so what else? Anything else you want to share before we close? What, what is Spirit guiding you to tell folks who are listening? Well, I just so much enjoy this encounter with you. I have to say I, I have enjoyed your books, but meeting you there, I think it was at the conference in uh, San Francisco, was such a delight. I felt such a deep connection. I feel your humor is uh, so healing and so important uh, in, in a world where often spiritual writings are quite serious. Uh, they, they don't have that light touch with them. And to me, the light, that light touch is so important. And I have to say, too, for those who are going to look at the book, that, that uh, Alan wrote the foreword, and I'm just so honored that you would write a foreword for this book because um, I feel you are just very highly respected and, and I can just feel your heart that that's with those watching those YouTubes and our meeting, I could just feel your heart, I could feel that connection. And to me, that's the most important thing, that heart to heart connection. The rest is just words, you know, but it's so beautiful to have someone who has such a beautiful heart, and I'm really honored that uh, we share this journey together as, as brothers uh, opening to this love. Thank you, my brother. I sure love you so deeply. Thank you so, so much. 
Is there anything else going on in your service world besides the book that you like people to know about and new programs or are you kind of laying low? What would you like people to know about? Well, this year is quite an amazing year. We have had a, com a movie, a documentary going in the community that was filmed at one of our uh, month-long mystery schools. And uh, it's called Take Me Home, and it's going to be coming out this year. Uh, and that is amazing because it, it doesn't so much focus on the, the verbiage of the teachings, but it's through, just like a well-crafted movie uh, that you can feel uh, with the scenery, with the images, it, it takes you right in and you're, you cry and your heart opens. So I'm excited about that. That's that. Take me home. My friend Francis Zhu has directed that, and we've had a lot of the community involved in that. Uh, this book, this moment is your miracle. Uh, we not only are it's coming out on February second here very quickly, but it's uh, we're going to be sharing about it. And uh, Jenny and Greg, who are in the studio, are going to be traveling around, and I'm going to do a couple appearances. Once one's up in. Uh, Oakland, uh, Berkeley. Berkeley is such a great area for expansive thinking up there and then down in, in Del Mar, uh, a little bit north of San Diego. So that's exciting. And then also we have a, a new center this year opening up on the island of Mallorca in the Mediterranean. Uh, it, it, it's just gorgeous over there and we're just excited to have a, a, like a, a base, a permanent base over there in Europe where we can just share and shine and have devotionals and and continue on the work we're doing. So there's a lot cooking here in 2019. And people can find you mostly at davidhoffmeister.com or is there another web, web address you like? Yeah, that's pretty much the main portal to find me. And then, yeah, there's lots of other uh, YouTube and Spreaker and yeah. many other ways. <laughs> Phenomenal YouTube subscriptions, like 230,000. I was so impressed. It's like people find you and love you and keep watching you turn their friends on to you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, they're having the same experience where I did a, two or three years ago, I did a retreat at our monastery, uh, Living Miracles Monastery. And I just asked the people, I said, How did you get here? And like 90% of the people said, Through YouTube. And I said, amazing, that is, uh, that the technology is really being used by the Holy Spirit. You know, I think you're so personable and so amiable that your essence comes through in the YouTube. People see your face and they see a smile, they see you're a joyful creature, they see you laughing, they hear your stories. It's such a wonderful venue to connect with you. I mean, if, if anything proved that we're not limited to our bodies, it's this technology where our spirit is imbued in a technology and we're connecting with each other's spirits, even if our bodies are on the other side of the planet. So, I mean, what a great teaching that is. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a, in that sense, it's a fun time to be alive. Uh, you know, where even though our title was living in times where uh, external world events seem to be cuckoo, but, but actually the flip side is it's, with the technology which you just described, it's kind of a, a wonderful way to experience each other. It's a big acceleration, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I may mention briefly, um, I'm starting my own foray into webinars with the Course of Miracles, and I'll be doing a monthly webinar on the Course of Miracles. So if people want to find me, it's at alancohen.com, if I may, and they can sign up for my monthly webinar. Oh, that's beautiful. Would you like to close us out with a prayer or anything that you think would be appropriate to tie this up, Mr. David? Yes. Spirit, thank you for coming into our hearts. Thank you for shining through us, radiating through us. May we always remember our need for you, beloved Spirit, because for us to let go of our attachments and our worries and concerns, we need to follow you. And we are here for you. We say yes when you call to us. Amen.
Thank you, David Hoffmeister, for being one of the most blessed lights on the planet that I know. And I wish you well in every dimension. And I wish everyone who touches you through your teaching the highest blessings. We are very graced to have you on the planet. Thank you, Alan. Love you. Love you. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.